Anne Collins Goodyear, co-director with my husband Frank of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. We are delighted to welcome you this evening for a presentation by Professor Catherine Geary, providing an introduction to the museum's most recent exhibition, New Views of the Middle Ages, Highlights from the Wyvern Collection. And before I go any further, I just want to let anybody who would like to use captions know that we have activated the closed caption feature. So please just click on CC. And of course, keep in mind that it is sometimes difficult for the closed captioning function um, to pick up specialized vocabulary. So you may need to interpret some of the um, written captions with a little grain of salt. And while we're speaking about logistics, um, I also will mention that Kate Geary has agreed to take questions at the end of our presentation. And when we come to that point in the evening, we'll invite you to use the Q&A function on your screen. New Views of the Middle Ages, highlights from the Wyvern Collection, which we recently installed at the museum, will be on view through next summer. We can't wait to share it with the public when it is safe to do so. Under normal circumstances, we would take tremendous pleasure in welcoming you, in, in welcoming you into our galleries following the opening keynote lecture by the exhibition's curator. This evening, we invite you to meet us in spirit through cyberspace. Following Kate's talk, we hope you will take time to visit a virtual version of the exhibition available online through the museum's website. We also invite you to enjoy the beautiful catalog which accompanies the exhibition. Finally, we hope you will join us for future programming related to the show, including a special panel on Thursday, November 5th. Tonight, we take special pleasure in hearing about the development of new views of the Middle Ages in tandem with Kate Geary, curator of this pathbreaking show and editor of the accompanying catalog. Kate also serves as visiting assistant professor of art history at Bowdoin College. Kate's remarkable scholarship has benefited from a background that combines curatorial and academic appointments. She has served previously as a research associate and curatorial fellow at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, where she co-authored the book, The Medieval Art, the, the Medieval World, The Walters Art Museum. And she has taught at a number of institutions prior to coming to Bowdoin, including Johns Hopkins, the University of Kansas, and the Memphis College of Art. Her research centers on manuscripts, and portable arts made in Europe between the 11th and the 13th centuries, with a particular focus on relic cults and the monastic communities of the British Isles. At Bowdoin, Kate has made a point of engaging her students with object-based research. And indeed, the students in her fall 2019 seminar, Medieval Art and the Modern Viewer, building an exhibition with the Wyvern Collection, not only supported research into this exhibition, but also contributed short essays on a number of works to the catalog. We are thrilled that this fall, Kate is teaching a class dedicated to building a virtual exhibition, a hands-on experience, and look forward to seeing what results. One of the special pleasures of exhibitions is the collaborations that they, both in, that they both require and inspire. New Views of the Middle Ages, highlights from the Wyvern Collection is no exception. There are many expressions of appreciation in order this evening. I would like to start with a huge thanks to Kate for her extraordinary work on this exhibition as a new faculty member at Bowdoin and particularly in the midst of the exceptional circumstances that befell us last spring and continue this fall. We are grateful to the amazing students whose great work she helped to inspire. 
We also offer a special thanks to Professor St Stephen Perkinson for all his support and to the many faculty colleagues from across campus who he helped gather to consult about the exciting teaching and research opportunities offered by the Wyvern Collection and this project. At the museum, we appreciate the efforts of the many colleagues who enabled us to receive, study, and install works from the Wyvern Collection. A special debt of gratitude is owed to Elizabeth Humphrey for the outstanding work she did to coordinate the logistical demands of our catalog and the development of our online exhibition and the installation of works in our galleries. We thank Ayla Lapine for her fascinating contribution to our catalog. We also express our appreciation for generous support from the Stevens L. Frost Endowment Fund. Finally, I want to close by acknowledging the extraordinary individual who has built the Wyvern Collection and who has generously entrusted the museum with the long-term loan of 100 works of art from which the present exhibition is drawn. Weaving together 50 of these remarkable objects, new views of the Middle Ages will, we hope, continue to inspire further creative responses to these historic artworks, which have so much to teach us about ourselves. We are grateful for the vision and insight that has not only shaped the Wyvern Collection, but that also recognizes the powerful resource its masterworks represent when shared with students and scholars who can, with this special opportunity for study and reflection, once again, share them with the world through new interpretive lenses. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kate Geary. Kate. Well, thank you, Anne. Thank you for that very um, generous uh, introduction. And I also want to join you in thanking all of the people that have made this show possible. Um, you know, any exhibition is truly a collaborative effort that benefits from the expertise and the insights of so many people who are involved. And um, like you, I particularly want to thank the, uh, the collector who made these works available to us. It was uh, an act of generosity and insight into how we could use them, I think, in a museum setting and importantly in an educational context. And I also want to thank Elizabeth Humphrey, uh, who uh, has just done an excellent job of keeping me and everyone else on track to make sure that these, uh, these things actually came about and came to fruition. So what I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about um, the exhibition and the structure of the exhibition uh, and then also spend probably most of the time tonight really zeroing in on a few selected works from the show and giving you a sense of how they fit into the show and kind of unpacking those works and making them a little bit more accessible to, uh, to viewers. So I am going to try to limit myself to uh, 30 minutes and I would be very happy to take questions afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead right now and share my screen, which always takes me a second to kind of get that going and play my slide presentation here. Um, so as I said, I want, to, I want to kind of start off by giving a little bit of an overview of the exhibition. Um, of course, I can't, I can't bring you into the exhibition, which is in some ways heartbreaking, but I'm happy that we have a chance to uh, bridge that gap through digital means by having online uh, webinars like this, online events like this. The exhibition is actually installed. Um, we've been working on it for about a year and a half, I think, and there was a real moment for me of, um, of fear really last spring when everything started to kind of fall apart and I really wasn't sure what was going to happen with this, how much the bricks were going to be put on, if it was in fact just going to fall apart. But we were able to move forward, not only to move forward with an online presence, but to actually install it in the galleries. And that really would not have been possible without the support and the dedication of the college and the museum, and especially the directors of the museum, Annie and Frank Goodyear, who have really stood by this show and believed in it and helped to keep it going through those, through those difficult times. So um, as I said, I would love to have a chance to actually be in the gallery space and walk through that with you. But that's not to be tonight. Hopefully we'd have a chance to welcome people into it um, later in, probably not later in this year, but maybe by next spring. 
here's another view of the what the show looks like. It is it is lovely in person even if you can't be there. So as I was working on this show, as I mentioned, it's the collaborative effort uh, between me and colleagues at Bowdoin and other campuses in other institutions. But one of the things which I think really makes this particular exhibition special is the amount of student involvement that has gone into building the exhibition. So particularly with the students who took part in my seminar last fall, Medieval Art and the Modern Viewer, um, their insight, the questions that they had to ask, the research they did as part of that class really drove forward a lot of my thinking about the exhibition and informed how it came together uh, in, its, in its final form. Not just within that class, but also in other classes, the spring before that I was teaching another seminar, which was not centered on this collection, but that spring, that was when these loan objects first arrived. And from the moment that we had opened up the packing cases, students were in there looking at objects, thinking about them, incorporating them into their research in that seminar. And other students that I have brought from other classes that I've brought into the museum to see these works in other contexts, their insights and their comments and their questions have also really fed into how I, um, how I have thought about these works and my ideas about them and how they have eventually come together into this exhibition. So um, that's been a really special part for me of, uh, of this particular show. I designed the show around three main themes and I want to just kind of walk you through those themes right now. These are all overarching ideas which right now I think are really driving forward research and thinking in the field of medieval art history, medieval studies more generally. Um, and I think that there are also themes that are appealing to a broader audience, to a more general audience, and hopefully are ways that people can find inroads into this material. People can use these themes to find connections between art which was made in a different context 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,200 years ago, to find connections between those works of art and their own lives today. So the first of these three themes is uh, related to the materiality of works of art and the techniques and the processes and the materials that go into creating works of art. Um, and so I'm calling this theme the substance and craft of medieval art. And this was a chance to highlight some of the major media which were popular with artists and patrons in this period. That can sometimes be surprising to us. I think we have, even if we haven't really considered it, we have ideas about kind of hierarchies of materials. What what is really art and what isn't maybe art with a capital A? What belongs in a museum? What do we expect to see in a gallery? And for us, usually panel paintings are near the top of that hierarchy. If you think about going to a museum or a gallery, that's probably the first thing you expect to see is a framed painting on the wall. In the Middle Ages, that really wasn't the case at all. They had some panel paintings, um, but it was other media, works in metalwork, small precious items that were created to contain relics or to be used within Christian practice, stained glass windows, sculptures that adorned the outsides of buildings. These were really the media that they were more concerned with and more interested in. The next thing which I think is really important and I was very pleased to be able to, to bring to greater light in this show is the idea of global networks and the exchange of ideas that happened in the Middle Ages. I think when we think about this period in history or many periods in history you know we tend to really compartmentalize specific areas so we think of europe as its own space we think of asia as its own space and we forget that any particular location is really one node on a larger network um, and so one of the things that we can find if we start looking for it is that many of the key ideas the methods the materials the types of art people were producing in Europe in the Middle Ages were really indebted to things which Europeans had learned from other cultures as they as they themselves traveled, uh, materials which were imported from far away, and that that was a two-way street. So we see um, we see those interactions affecting the development of art produced in Europe and also outside of that. And I'm thinking of particularly areas like in East Africa in the Ethiopian Kingdom. Several of the works in this show are from that area. We certainly see developments in Persia and the Middle East and even as far as uh, East Asia affecting what's happening in Europe in the Middle Ages. And then the last theme which comes out in this show is a theme about identity and how people define themselves. Um, and I think this is particularly of interest to us today as we wrestle with lots of changes in how we as individuals are defining ourselves 
and relating to larger society. Um, so thinking about the ways that people in the past might have used visual art to help them sort through some of those issues, to help them present who they wanted to be, right? I mean, to really craft their own sense of identity and present that to the world. Um, so those are things which, which can come out in, within the show. If you were to visit the exhibition and walk through it, those three themes are actually divided into three separate spaces. But in fact, I think that those three themes are interwoven through the entire exhibition. And just about any work that you pick out of that exhibition, it would, it would be possible to tie that into any of these three strands. And so that's one of the things I want to do this evening as I kind of walk you through some of the individual pieces in the show. I've selected just a few pieces to pull out as highlights. I do want to say um, I'm, I'm not selecting them because I think they're the best or I think that they're my favorite pieces. Someone asked me earlier today if I had a favorite piece in the show and it kind of reminded me of, of a question like if I had a favorite child, right? And that's, I, they're all wonderful. Everything in the show is amazing. It has its own unique qualities and characteristics and its own stories to tell. But I've selected a few works that I think will allow me to show you how these individual works of art can really elucidate these broader themes of the show. So the first piece I want to speak about this evening is a small plaque and it is actually on my screen it's actually about life size so depending on what kind of screen you're watching it on that could be different. Um, this is often a difficulty with presenting art outside of the actual physical space of the gallery is that all of these images are going to look the same size to you, even though some of the things you'll see are quite tiny, other things might be quite large. Um, so I have included the measurements down, but this is a relatively small piece. It's a plaque. It's a plaque made of mother of pearl, which is an interesting material in and of itself. And this piece can, I think, as I said, help us to elucidate and explore a number of the different themes within the show. So the first thing I want to talk about is the um, the material itself, um, where that's coming from, and particularly how it's used within conjunction, uh, sorry, how it's used in conjunction with the function of the piece insofar as we know what that might be. So one thing we can say about this piece, um, before we even get into the specifics of the iconography, the images that are shown on it, or the materials themselves, is that this is a work which uh, was probably a very precious and highly valued item. Many of the pieces from this period were things which were made, not necessarily for individuals, but were made to be used within a church setting, made to be owned by a monastic community. Um, and as we get into the later Middle Ages, into the 15th, even into the early 16th century, we see increasingly a tendency for individuals who are themselves gaining wealth to, to seek out and own beautiful, precious items to really become collectors. And so a work like this, although it probably had a devotional function, which I'll speak to in a minute, it also was probably a prized collected item, which I can't say this for sure, this is to some extent speculative, but which the owner might have displayed within their home, might have used as a way to, uh, to enrich their own lives, but also to signal to their guests their level of learning and sophistication. Um, so this is a, a moment when we see the rise of what we call cabinets of curiosity or Kunstkammer, which are almost kind of proto-museums that individual wealthy learned collectors would bring together items from their travels, from exotic locations in the world, from the past, from the present, and really use those, as I said, as a way to, um, to demonstrate their learning to, uh, to their guests, the visitors, and to kind of use that even to spur on some conversation. So we can, I think, see this as a piece which would allow an individual to show a certain kind of persona to the world, right? To show themselves as a, as a collector, as a wealthy person, as a learned person. It is also a devotional item. It is carved with a scene of Christian religious imagery and works like this were intended, scenes like this in many media were intended to help people to really focus their meditations, to think deeply about their Christian beliefs and principles. And it was really in the service of prayer that they would utilize items like this. Um, and so this is a, a particular type of image known as the tree of Jesse, which is a, uh, a sort of medieval 
um, representation of the earthly lineage of Christ. So it is based on the book of Isaiah in the Bible, and it represents at the bottom is Jesse, one of the ancestors of Christ, and then it, it is a, a figurative representation of a tree, right, a family tree growing out of Jesse, and then we can see the ancestors through David, through the Virgin Mary, and then we have Christ at the top, in this case, shown as an infant. The tree of Jesse is an image which we see in many different contexts in the Middle Ages. We see it in stained glass, we see it in wall paintings, and increasingly in the later Middle Ages, especially towards the end of the 15th century, we start seeing it as an image created in print culture as part of people's devotional practice. So I'm showing you here a print from a prayer book that was produced right around the same time as this carving. And I think you can see right away uh, that there are great similarities between these pieces. And it is, I think, demonstrable that the tree of Jesse carved here in Mother of Pearl is really based directly on one of these printed images. So we can see a really interesting interaction there between media the way that images develop in different media and then they can move back and forth between them. The printed image in this case from a woodcut and then carved into this very precious, rare, difficult to work with material of Mother of Pearl. The material of Mother of Pearl is also a way for us to think about the kind of global connections that I had referenced in the Middle Ages. Mother of Pearl is taken from the inside of the shell of certain mollusks and those the the type of mollusks that produce it are uh, live in a few different places in the world but not every place and so it's quite likely that the mother of pearl used in this example was imported from either the red sea or the indian ocean so that's quite a long way away from the workshop in either france or germany where this piece was created uh, so we can really see there the the distance over which items traveled to be used. And I think that can also give us a sense of the value that might have been placed on this, that it had a kind of um, import beyond its beauty and beyond any symbolic associations that might have been there. It was also valued because it was a rare material that came from very far away. It would have been very expensive to acquire something like this. That issue of, uh, of travel and of Europe as, you know, kind of a, a one, as I said before, one node in this network of greater travel um, really comes to light in several different pieces in this collection. And I want to move now to a different work of art um, and take a look at this piece, which I think also can really demonstrate the role that individual works of art can play in these kinds of um, long distance exchanges that happen. So this is a work, uh, we, we call it a work like this a diptych which is a complicated word that really just means is it has two panels. And usually when we use the word diptych, it's a two paneled devotional painting of some sort. So in this case, there is a saint on one side, St. George mounted on a horse, and on the other side, the Virgin Mary with the Christ child. So two uh, Christian images here paired together. And you can see that they are, in this case, um, it's actually twine or string that is used to create the hinge there. This idea of having two panels that kind of are joined together and open up like a book. We see that in other regions too. We see it in Ethiopia, we see it in Europe, um, but this, this method of joining them is something that is particular to the region where this was made, which is in, um, in East Africa, in present-day Ethiopia and present-day Eritrea, what at the time was known as um, the, uh, the kingdom of, or the Ethiopian kingdom, sorry. It varies sometimes between being a kingdom and an empire. So we have this piece and I think looking at it, you will probably notice right away um, that there are two very different styles that we can see in these two panels. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail unpacking that, but certainly if you look at the degree of three dimensionality that comes across in the image on your right of the Virgin and Child, as opposed to the much more kind of abstracted, flat, bold nature of the image of St. George on the left, um, the way that the colors have been handled, the use of uh, the gold background, and especially the gold highlighting on the drapery folds and the image on the Virgin. Right, those are, those are things that really separate these two panels and suggest to us that they were not made by the same person and probably not made in the same time and place. The panel of the Virgin and Child 
um, is actually quite similar to many works which were made in the Mediterranean region throughout the Middle Ages and especially in the 15th century. Um, the example that I'm comparing that with here was likely made in present day Greece or Crete. The example from the Wyvern collection has been, has been suggested it might have been made on the island of Crete, someplace within the orbit of the Byzantine Empire, which at this point, uh, for the second half of the 15th century, that's right when the Byzantine Empire is actually ceasing to exist. Uh, but we still see its cultural reverberations really resonating throughout the Mediterranean. So my best guess would be that this piece, this painting of the Virgin and Child, was made as a standalone piece, not a part of a diptych, but a single panel. And that, I say that because that was the common form for these devotional panel paintings or icons from this region at this time. Um, so we can look at this, we can look at the stylistic similarities with other pieces that were made in the area, and we can, we can surmise that it was very likely made probably in the Eastern Mediterranean. What happens? Somehow it ends up traveling from the Eastern Mediterranean, from Crete or from Greece, possibly from Italy, all the way down to the Kingdom of Ethiopia. We don't know how that happened, uh, but there are plenty of very plausible paths for how that might have happened. We know that there was trade going on between these places. We have documented accounts of Ethiopian Christian pilgrims traveling from Ethiopia to the Holy Land, to Constantinople, now Istanbul. Uh, we know that there were diplomatic contacts going on between European political powers in the Mediterranean and Ethiopian kings. So there's lots of ways that something like this could have happened. We even have one case of a painter who was born in Italy and himself traveled to Ethiopia and then continued to paint in that region. So there's lots of ways that this single painting of the Virgin and Child could have arrived in Ethiopia. And once it gets there, what happens is this item is then created. I think what we're seeing here is an Ethiopian artist um, responding to this panel painting of the Virgin. It would not be an unfamiliar type of painting, but what they're doing here is they're creating, they're creating this other panel to go with it, right? They're transforming it from a single panel into a two-paneled object. And in doing that, the Ethiopian artist is not, he's not making any kind of attempt to mimic the Mediterranean style or to make it look like it belongs together. An interesting aspect of that transformation also is this pairing of St. George with, with the Virgin. St. George was certainly known in Europe, but, but in Europe was not, he was not such a popular saint as he was in Ethiopia. And particularly this pairing of St. George and the Virgin was a kind of ubiquitous uh, grouping in Ethiopia. We see them all the time together. The idea is that St. George was considered a kind of spiritual protector of the Virgin Mary. And so having these two saints together really transforms this into an object which would be much more familiar and usable to someone in Ethiopia, right? It's taking that, that item from Europe and then transforming it into something that works better for the circumstance that it is now in, um, in Ethiopia. So I want to move on from that piece and look at another work in some detail. I particularly selected this one because I wanted to look at something secular. Uh, a lot of surviving art from the Middle Ages is, is certainly religious in nature and was made for religious circumstances, but um, it, can, and it can be easy to lose track of the secular world. But certainly we know that um, you know, people were living, living their lives and thinking about other things. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring in another piece that would attest to that other side of life. So this is a really interesting object. It's called a gemellium. Um, that's probably not a word that you've heard before. It, it literally means twin, and it's one of a pair. So right now, this is the only one of the pair that survives. Um, and we have a number of these surviving from this period. As far as I know, we don't actually have any matched pairs that survive. We just always have one or the other. They, had a very, they have a very interesting function. Uh, the function of them is often secular. It's literally for hand washing. So the two, pair, the two items in the pair would both be a kind of shallow bowl. One of them is a basin like this one and you would have on the table in front of you and you would put your hands over that. The other one was a shallow bowl that had a little spout on it and someone would pour the spout over your hands so that the water would run over your hands and you could wash them and then the water would be caught in the basin below. So used for hand washing, 
probably at uh, at dinner services, particularly in in kind of aristocratic backgrounds, right? I mean, this isn't something that peasants are using when they have lunch out in the fields, uh, but really something that would be used in wealthier households and possibly maybe for dinners that were certainly more formal kind of banquets or feasts. This Jamelian is also quite secular in the imagery that it employs. So the title that we've given it here, Armorial Jamelian, that just refers to the fact that it's decorated with coats of arms with heraldic symbols. And that's very common. There are, there are dozens of Jamelians that survive that have very similar imagery on them. So when we take a look at this piece, um, you know, one of the ways that we can kind of get some access to it and think about it is to think about the materials and the techniques. As I mentioned before, that's one of the themes of this show. We've seen a little bit of how that can play out when we looked at the uh, mother of pearl plaque. But I want to spend some time talking here about metalwork, which was really one of the most highly valued um, media in medieval art. In this case, this is made, uh, it's a type of metalwork called enamel, and it's a particular type of technique called champlevé enamel. What that means is that you start with a metal substrate, often copper, sometimes gilt copper, as in, which was the case here, although most of the gilt and the thin layer of gold was worn off. And you create recesses in the surface of that copper, in the case of champlevé enamel, by literally kind of gouging out from the surface. And you can see this a little bit. If you look at the detail I've brought up, you can see where the blue enamel is missing, that there's a little recessed space there where in the 800 years since it was made, some of the enamel has uh, fallen away. And you can see where that space was created for the color. So you gouge out those recesses in the metal, fill them with a, a kind of paste made from ground colored glass. And then when you heat it up high enough, probably to about a thousand degrees Celsius, the, the ground powdered glass literally turns back into glass. And as it cools down, you're left not with a powder or a paste anymore, but with a very shiny, hard, smooth, gem-like kind of surface. This, of course, has suffered some wear, right? It's, it's uh, 800 years old, and we're not really seeing it, therefore, in its best light. You have to imagine back the kind of deep, warm tones of the copper the richer colors that the, the blue and the red and a little bit of green in this enamel would have been more uh, more rich colors, the shiny nature of that surface, which we're really missing here. Um, but, but anyway, this was a technique which was very popular at the time. This piece was probably made in, in or around the city of Limoges in France, which is an important location for enamel development in this period. People did make enamel works elsewhere, but Limoges developed a particular high reputation for their enamel. And they were often making enamel, the workshops of Limoges were making enamel, not always for the highest level of patrons, but they were, they were almost kind of mass producing it. And they were making it to ship all around Europe to different churches, to different private owners. Um, we, can, we can often see a type of work like these Jamelians where we have dozens surviving and there must be hundreds if not thousands that have been lost over time. Many of them are relatively indistinguishable from the rest. So they were, they were kind of mass produced for a market rather than a single item made to order for a patron. And it's interesting, you know, we can see Limoges as the center of production here, um, but these works show up across vast distances, really testifying to that movement of people and of ideas and of materials at this time. So Limoges is in France, that's where these are made. We have examples surviving all across Europe, from Spain to Russia, from Denmark to Italy. And maybe at first you think, okay, well, Denmark, not that far from France, but that's a long way to go if you're, you know, if, if a horse in a wagon is your method of getting there. Um, but we find them even further afield. There are examples that are known from the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, from Jerusalem. And there is some evidence which is inconclusive, but suggestive that, that works from Limoges actually were carried as far as East Asia were carried to China by Franciscan missionaries. So it really got around, right? We can see Europe producing this product which was desired in a, in a much, larval, uh, sorry, much larger global market. Um, when we take a look at this, we can also take a look at this from the standpoint of iconography of the imagery that's shown and how we interpret that imagery. And I think here we can kind of get a sense of how people are again using art to kind of project 
the persona that they want to have, to project some aspect of their identity, whether that is real or desired. So this, as I noted, is decorated with coats of arms. Um, many of the coats of arms on this piece and on similar Gemellians from other collections are relatively generalized. So the one I pulled out here uh, in the highlight is what we call a, a lion rampant uh, heraldry coats of arms. We have their whole very complicated language of how to describe all of these images. But we see this lion in profile, quite schematic, as if it's standing on its hind legs and, and kind of raising its hands to the side. So that lion rampant is a very common coat of arms. Um, individuals could have coats of arms, families could have coats of arms, and they could sometimes be used individually to recognize a single unique individual. But a lot of times, especially with symbols like this lion rampant, it just became a kind of generalized imagery. Many people chose to have a similar coat of arms because they knew other people that did. They, they knew wealthier people, more important people, kings, rulers in other areas, and they wanted their own coats of arms to look a little bit like that. And so symbols like this become very widespread. So that means that we can't always use these coats of arms to identify a, a particular patron. And I think it also helps us to get a sense that these coats of arms on this Gemellingen, they're not referring so much to individuals as to a kind of generalized aristocratic atmosphere that the person who has this in their home, the person who is inviting you to dinner in their home and offering this to you to wash your hands in before you eat, they are suggesting to you that they are a part of this larger aristocratic world. And there are specific references to real individuals here. So another one of the coats of arms in here is specific to the king and queen of France, probably a generation or two before this piece was made. Uh, but we have this coat of arms in the bottom, which divides the fleur de lis, which is the, um, the sign of the royal family of France, and then the castles against the red ground, which is the heraldry for Blanche of Castile, who was the wife of Louis VIII, and then the mother who often ruled in place of uh, Louis IX a little later in the 13th century. This piece is not, it's not exquisite and expensive enough to have been made for Louis or Blanche. This is not a piece that would have been made for a member of the royal family. They would have had a much nicer version of a Gemellian like this. So we can, I think we can rule them out as patrons. And again, just see this as part of this kind of generalized atmosphere of, uh, of aristocracy. And we can put that against the background of, this is a moment when, um, you know, the, the tales of King Arthur's court are, are becoming ubiquitous. Everyone is familiar with these tales of courtly love and chivalric romance. And it's also a moment that's really marked by the Crusades uh, and the different kind of roles that came to the European aristocracy, especially lower tiers of the aristocracy as a result of the process of the Crusades. And I just, I just pull up another Gemellian here, this one in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and this one, this one also has some very generalized imagery, but includes the coat of arms of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. Um, so again, this object, Right, we can kind of see the owner of this using it to insert themselves into this kind of larger world, and at the same time, it, it can speak in other ways to the um, the broad reach of people as they as they move around Europe, as they move beyond Europe, and create identities for themselves in new contexts. So I am just at thirty minutes right now, and I do want to leave time for questions, and I also want to be sensitive to uh, the kind of Zoom fatigue that we can get of just staring at the screen. So I am going to, um, to end here and I will stop sharing my screen, but I can bring it back up if there are uh, questions that, that the, the slides would help with. Thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to hearing um, comments and questions. Kate, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation um, and it's, really exciting to hear about the way in which you have um, developed thematic strategies for presenting this material that resonate in such interesting ways um, with our own era. And one of the first questions that has come in um, asks if you could speak a little bit about new discoveries um, that came about as you were um, working on this material and the degree to which the material in the Wyvern collection helped you to hone um, this strategy for um, describing the material. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, we were actually able, we've been able to make some very interesting discoveries, especially utilizing certain kinds of imaging technologies. And I'm anticipating that that will continue, um, especially this semester, as I have a number of students who are interested in creating further online content around the show, specifically using a lot of imaging strategies. So uh, for one example of that, um, in the seminar I was teaching last fall, I had several students who did um, RTI, reflectance transformation imaging. I'm not gonna go into the details of how to do that, but it involves taking a series of photographs that allow you then to look at an image and manipulate how the light is shining as you're looking at the image. So you can really get different kinds of viewpoints different kinds of lighting that you would not normally be able to get at a single time if you were just looking at the object in person. And using that technique, um, we were able to get some really interesting insights into these works. Um, for example, there's a, a I, don't, I don't have a slide of it tonight, but a, a brooch, a kind of fancy safety thing really, um, although that, doesn't, that description doesn't do it justice, it's a really beautiful object, but a, a brooch from uh, the Merovingian dynasty in the kingdom of Spankia. So that it's, it's, the, it's probably the sixth century in present day France or Germany. Um, and that is a work, we, we can see many typical features of, uh, of works of art from that period. But when we used RTI, we were really able to get a much better sense of the specific, the tool marks, I mean, to get a sense of the kinds of tools that people were using to shape the surface of the metal, to create different textures and patterns in the surface of the metal. And we could see those much more clearly than we could just see them with the naked eye. Uh, and that same kind of technology allowed us also, there was another panel, uh, there is a panel in the collection in this exhibition, uh, a much later piece created in enamel from a, a later type of enameling than the Champlevay enameling I was just showing you. Um, and that piece had some repair, which is very common in medieval art. You know, things are around for hundreds of years, something happens to them and they have to get fixed. Um, but there is a way in which when you look at it just with your eyes, the repair, you know, you can see that it's there, but you don't get such a clear picture of it. But the RTI really allowed us to see in much greater detail the, the scope of that repair. And I think to, to, to really contrast the different techniques that were used between the later repair to the enamel and the original enameling process that had taken place in around 1600 on that panel. So that was another um, wonderful way that especially student research was able to uncover some new facets of these, uh, of these items. Um, I think if I'm remembering this, the second part of that question was to think about ways that work specifically from the Wyvern collection have generated new thinking <laughs> or new research. Exactly, exactly. And, and specifically the thematic structures um, yeah. you use to present this material. I think one really exceptional part about this grouping of objects that we have is the ability to, um, to pair up the, the works from Ethiopia and the works from Europe. So I just showed you one example of an Ethiopian piece, but there are several other pieces in the show. And they really allow us, I think, to see very clearly how what, what began, you know, centuries before, what began as a kind of common tradition, uh, a common tradition of Christian art being made in the early medieval period, develops in really different ways in these different regions. So they're still utilizing a lot of the same forms. They're still making illuminated manuscripts, both in Europe and in Egypt. And they're making processional crosses, both in Europe and in Egypt. And they're making devotional paintings in Europe and in Egypt. But the ways in which those things develop in different styles, using different techniques, having really different emphases, uh, I think becomes very clear when we can put objects in dialogue with each other. Um, and so I've been very excited in the exhibition to be able to do that. And that's something that can be seen also in the online version of the exhibition that you can, you know, you can look at the European processional cross, which really emphasizes figural work and has a, a enamel, probably Limoges enamel, rendering of Christ's body, and then an Ethiopian processional cross, which really, um, you know, we don't see much figural work in those. There's a whole body of these Ethiopian crosses that really moves much more in the direction of, um, of symbolic ornament and using the forms and the shapes of the cross to suggest ideas rather than relying on an image of the human figure. So we can, you know, we can kind of see the same core of the idea of developing in these different directions. And that's been a really wonderful feature of the show. That's fascinating. Another 
um, interesting question, which I think um, uh, sort of is, is a, great, a great segue from what you just observed, has to do with um, the emergence of um, new techniques and, and forms, as you mentioned, um, in this work. And the question is, how does this um, help, the, help pave the way um, for the future development of um, Western or um, sort of internationally hybrid art forms? Are you, are you asking if this can give us some insight into how contemporary art is developing? I, I think I think um, that the that the spirit of the question is um, to sort of get at how the work in this collection um, helps give us um, a foundation for the future development of Western art. Um, but I hesitate a little bit in saying Western because you've just made such an important point that of course there's a blend of many different traditions represented. Right. Well, I I. Uh, <laughs> I am not going to to offer any predictions on where art is going, <laughs> um, but I but I do think that um, you know one thing that we can take away from this is we have in our current moment we have a set of global relations that we're used to. We think about who gets along with each other and who doesn't get along with each other. What are the sources of conflict and what are not the sources of conflict? Mm -hmm. So I mean just to to give a very blunt example. Um, you know, any any examination of the news over the last 20 years would really highlight conflicts between um, Islamic culture as developed in the Middle East currently. And I, 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 want to, I, I don't necessarily want to say specifically Christian, but I don't like to use the term Western, but that's probably the one people are more familiar with, right? But kind of whatever is, whatever is happening um, in Europe and America. And to see those two things as really opposed and they haven't always been opposed there have certainly been moments when there has been tension between christians and muslims there have certainly been moments when there have been those tensions have have been out of control and, and led to great amounts of destruction and fighting but there have been also been many moments of people getting along fine people finding different ways to share communities um to live peacefully and to share ideas so one of the things that's in the show, uh, one of the pieces that is part of the Wyvern collection that's on display here is a, uh, a large ceramic dish, bracero, which was made in Spain towards the end of the Middle Ages. It was made at a time when the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, um, had, had recently been um, taken over by Christian rulers, taken over from previous Muslim rulers, especially the southern parts of Spain. When we look at this item, um, it's been decorated with a type of uh, glazing technique that we call lusterware, where we see um, it's a, particular kinds of metallic salts are used in a second layer of glazing that's added to the, over the, the first layer of glazing. And then after that is fired again, you get this very um, rich, shiny, usually kind of amber or gold tinted surface. Well, luster wear because it has a great luster. And, you know, we can track the development of the technique of luster wear. We, it, it's possible that people were doing it a little bit earlier, but we really see it being used to great effect beginning in, um, in uh, parts of present day Iraq, probably in the 10th and 11th century. And then we see it spreading all across the Muslim world. Um, and so we have another piece in the exhibition of an earlier bowl, a little bit smaller from Persia, present day Iran, which is also done in luster wear. And that is really the, the ancestor, as it were, of the Spanish bracero. So we can see, um, you know, this technique spread across the Muslim world was brought into the Iberian Peninsula when that region was the home of many Muslims and politically dominated by Muslim rulers. And then even though politically the situation shifted, it was still a prized and highly valued technique. So we can, you know, we can see this, the, the ways in which people were able to find common ground and to get along surviving in these individual works of art. And I think that can be a good lesson for us. And it can also just be a good reminder that, you know, we tend to see our current situation as universal and inevitable. But there have been many different ways that people have gotten along and interacted with each other. And if we look at the past, 
I don't want to say that it provides a direct model for us, but it can help us to imagine different situations and help us to see that different situations are possible. Kate, thank you so much. Um, speaking about um, relationships between individuals, there's another question about patronage. Um, you referenced that um, a little bit, I think, with respect to um, the, 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 the bowl you shared with us um, with the heraldic figures. Could you speak a little bit, and perhaps even with reference to specific objects in the show, um, about the types of patronage systems that existed and the cultural and social forces that were, were shaping those? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, and it's one that I think does, we do find a very different situation in the Middle Ages than today in terms of how we conceive of art and who's making it and who's responsible for it and who to whom we give credit for the creation and design of a work of art. Um, I am going to generalize here quite a bit. So when I talk about the Middle Ages, in, just, just in Europe, right, I'm talking about dozens of countries over the course of a thousand years. So obviously there were different situations at different times. It's not a static situation. But I would say that in general, we see the patron playing a more significant role in the development and the conception of the development of individual works of art than we do today. So today we, when we, how, however it actually plays out in practice, I think we tend to see something like a painting or a sculpture and we really think of the creator of that painting and sculpture being the artist, the maker, that we credit that person with thinking up the idea. Maybe someone else paid for it, right? But it's representing the, the thought processes and the, the learning and the ideas of the artist. I think when we look at medieval art, we're seeing much more of the result of a kind of conversation between the maker or the makers and the patrons. So that the person who paid for the work of art might very often have had a much stronger role in figuring out what that was going to look like. We don't know that that's the case in every situation. And we don't, many works from this period, we just don't have any documentation surviving from them if any ever existed at all. Um, so we, so a lot of times we, we have a few instances where we can, we have a little bit of documentation about one piece and we have to kind of generalize from there. But it seems that more often the case was that the person who was commissioning the work of art had a much greater say than we usually imagine in, in sort of directing how the, um, how the work would be designed and what kinds of ideas would come across in that. I don't want to downplay the role of the highly skilled and highly trained artists in doing that. I mean, if we think about something like that uh, mother of pearl plaque that I showed, you know, we might look at that and we might say, okay, the design for that plaque was essentially copied from a print and that print might have initially been derived from or copied from an earlier painting. And that painting might have been to some extent developed largely by a patron as much as by the artist. I don't, you know, I don't know the, the individual circumstances tracing it that far back, but that would, I think, be ignoring the huge amount of skill and training that went into carving something like Mother of Pearl, which is a notoriously difficult material to carve. It's very thin. It's made up of these kind of gradually built up micro layers of these secretions laid down by these mollusks. And then, you know, to try to work that and to, um, to, to especially, you know, that's a relatively large piece, to, to work that and create something so refined from it without breaking it. I mean, that's, that's just a huge skill. So, you know, I, I don't, when I'm talking about the increased role of the patron, I don't want to pay short shrift to the high achievements of the artists involved. But the idea of, you know, the, the creation of the piece, the craft that went into it, um, the, the genius of the artist in producing the, the physical realization of the idea is one thing that I think was seen as separate from the development of the idea, the development of how that idea would be portrayed. Absolutely. Kate, thank you so much. Um, this may be our final question, um, but somebody um, in the audience would like to hear a little bit more um, based on your conversation, your description of the diptych of St. George about the particular um, paths um, or um, interesting stories about provenance um, that might be represented by other objects in the collection. It's so exciting in that instance to hear about how a Mediterranean object seems to have made its way to Ethiopia 
and your discussion about St. George as a protective figure for the Virgin and the way in which the meaning gets shifted in that new cultural context is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Are there other objects in the exhibition that have similar stories um, about their travels or ownership that may illuminate a history of shifting meanings or, or other um, nuances? Absolutely, and often in different ways. So there are a number of pieces in this show which have a very interesting modern provenance, which is to say that they've been owned by interesting people since the Middle Ages, um, and several that we can kind of see a developing story in the Middle Ages. One piece that I would really bring up as a great representative of this is a book of hours, which is a particular type of hours in, in the sense of the hours like with an age time, um, which is a particular type of prayer book which became very popular in Europe from about the 13th century on into the 15th century. So there are many, many books of hours that survive. The one that has come to us as part of this loan is known as the Keeble Petri Hours. And um, there are, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful object, which in so many ways can serve as an excellent example for what these kinds of books look like, the kind of art we find in them, the kind of prayers we find in them. But one of the really wonderful things about this book, and this is true for other books of ours as well, is that people own them and a person might acquire one and then would certainly pass it down. They were highly valued objects. They would pass it down to their descendants. So a mother or a father might pass it down to their daughter or son when they got married uh, or after their own death. And then it would often go through several generations. And people would often use them much in the way that we think of maybe family Bibles sometimes being used, that they were a place to write down important family events. So when we look at the Keeble P3 hours, we can find inscriptions in that book that help us to map out some of the owners who actually owned it, the names of the individuals who owned it at different points in its history, and how it moved from uh, mother to her, uh, she, she died and her husband had it and then he left it to a child. And then at some point it was given to a different family and we can track it all the way down into the modern period. So that's a, a, an unusual situation in medieval art. We usually do not have such a full provenance for something. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to have an example like that book of ours. There are other examples I can bring up, but I see that we're at 7.59. I think we're supposed to, uh, I think we're supposed to end. Well, Kate, we all want to thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating um, discussion of the um, exhibition, New Views of the Middle Ages, highlights from the Wyvern Collection. I think you have tantalized us and left us all wanting more, um, which is exactly what a good talk should do. Um, for those of you uh, who can join us um, on November 5th um, at one o'clock, there will be an opportunity for another conversation about the Wyvern Collection that will examine the role of new technologies in sharing new insights into these new views of the Middle Ages. Thank you for being with us this evening. And Kate, thank you again for your extraordinary work in curating this exhibition. Thank you, Anne, and thanks to everyone for joining this evening. It was a really wonderful experience. Good night. <laughs>